Well, along with Hamilton Day, Oversimplified Day may be my favorite day of the week. It's been a few days since we checked in on that wild anime known as Russia and that story arc known as the Cold War. So we're going to finish that out today with Oversimplified the Cold War Part 2. Welcome back, friends, and a special welcome. Welcome to all the new friends out there. I'm Yo BGS. And yeah, thanks to Oversimplified, we've learned a little bit more about both world wars, a Russian revolution, and now literally getting to moments away from the world possibly facing extinction via the Cold War. And it's wild because we're getting to the point in history where some of the folks checking out this channel may have been alive, may remember, or definitely have parents that remember some of this stuff. You know, only about 30% of people who watch my videos are subscribed, so if you want to help the channel out a ton, make sure these videos get to other people. Subscribing is the easiest way to do it. And again, support Oversimplified and their sponsors because they do a remarkable job. So we had uh, Stalin took over, Stalin decided he didn't want to be around anymore, went blep, and now we're going to figure out where the Cold War could possibly go now. Khrushchev in charge, right? For anyone who thinks recent U.S. history has never been as crazy as it is right now. Oh, dude, I'm from like 12 months in the future. You have no idea. Allow me to present to you the 1960s, extreme cultural division, major political assassinations, and the closest the world has ever come to nuclear apocalypse. Shocked by the CIA's intrusive methods for putting down socialism in Latin America, a certain Fidel Castro met with a... Wait a minute. Oh... Op is that really called Operation PB Success? I thought they were going to say it was a banana republic. Putting down socialism in Latin America, a certain Fidel Castro met with a certain Che Guevara in a bar in Mexico City, and the two of them decided they should grow some awesome beards and overthrow the Cuban government, which is exactly what they did. Cuba had been America's summer... You have to appreciate the neutrality, right? He's able to say that, you know, even though uh, people have a lot of thoughts about Che and Castro, the beards were something else. Playground, and America didn't like seeing a communist regime being set up in its own backyard. So the U.S. immediately began training up Cuban exiles to invade Cuba and overthrow Castro. However, as the day of the operation came closer, Kennedy wanted to conceal any U.S. involvement in the plan. So he massively scaled back American air support, and as a result, the Bay of Pigs invasion was a humiliating defeat for America. But Castro felt there was still an impending U.S. threat to his regime. The way oversimplified animates historical fit, like, I don't know why this just makes me want to chuckle. They're like, they're caricatures, but not really over the top. Team. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev had a lot of medium range nuclear missiles that couldn't reach America, but they could if they were positioned, say, on an exotic Caribbean island off the coast of Florida. Hey, I'm a communist who hates America. You're a communist who hates America. You know what that means? We should fall in love. Uh, I was just going to suggest you set your missiles up in Cuba. Oh. The amount of fanfic and standing that Oversimplified does in his videos. I mean, again, I'm not going to shame anybody for thinking anything, but uh, quite, a, quite a bit of it. History would look very different if it went the way uh, Oversimplified's fanfics portray no, it. No, you're right. That's a better idea. Be still, my beating heart. Aww. On October 14th, 1962. Poor Khrushchev said nobody ever. A U-2 spy plane over Cuba noticed something strange. Sir, you need to look at this photograph. You're right. That's the cutest dog I've ever seen. Sir, I was referring more to the Soviet missiles. America freaked out as they realized what was going on. They were completely vulnerable and they had to act fast. They knew that airstrikes or an invasion of Cuba would likely mean nuclear war with the Soviet Union. So Kennedy came up with another idea. A blockade. The US Navy announced it would stop and search any Soviet ships heading to Cuba and would sink any that did not comply. In response, the Soviet put its military into full combat readiness. The US did the same and began drawing up plans for an attack on Cuba. Think that is... It's something about this picture, right? And again, you know, we... What is it, the end of the world? Yeah, the end of the world. That was that classic, like, Flash animation. Even then, where they're talking about have a nap, then fire the missiles. Like, it just... I don't know. I, I guess it's, you know, the knowing what that would actually mean. So then seeing it you know, alongside maps of the countries is kind of like, I don't know, it, it gives you it gives you goosebumps. And Even when it's just in a, a goofy, oversimplified animation. Drawing up plans for an attack. And then the caricature of Kennedy is just... <laughs> Seriously. 
The maps, though! Like, all the little details in these videos are so good. It's why I pause so much. On Cuba, things were escalating fast, and both superpowers were getting ready for World War III. Emergency communications between the two sides broke down as Khrushchev rejected Kennedy's demands for the missiles to be removed. And for the first time in history, you- DEFCON 1, we're all dead. DEFCON 2, America. DEFCON 3, someone's about to get liberated. DEFCON 4, Russia, please. DEFCON 5, anybody want to go get a burger? That's the funny thing. People think that, like, people get that twisted all the time, you know, and you'll even hear it in TV shows. Something will happen and they'll be like, oh, go to DEFCON 2. It's like, no, 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 no. You're going to DEFCON 4. We're, this is where we normally start. And, yeah, I, this kind of makes me want to look this up to see if at any point we've been... U.S. Strategic Air Command moved to DEFCON 2. De okay, that answers my question. See, if I just watched the video... I'd be okay. I didn't even realize we were had ever been at three before. DEFCON 1 means nuclear war. The Soviets shot down a U-2 spy plane over Cuba. A Soviet nuclear submarine in the Caribbean mistakenly believed war had already broken out, and two of the senior officers gave the go-ahead to fire its nuclear torpedo. Thankfully, the third senior officer, this beautiful man, refused to authorize the decision. The U.S. finalized its pre- One, actually a beautiful man. Two, thank God that he knew better. I'm just, I'm re-watching this because I'm like... The Soviets shot down a U-2 spy plane over Cuba. A Soviet nuclear submarine in the Caribbean mistakenly believed war had... Oh, okay, I see what happens. So they got weird intel there. It makes you wonder... Oh, there's the third general. But it makes you wonder what, like, this dude and this dude thought already broken out, and two of the senior officers gave the go-ahead to fire its nuclear torpedo. Thankfully, the third senior officer, this beautiful man, refused to authorize the decision. The U.S. finalized its preparations, and I kid you not, the day before the U.S. were set to decide the day and time for the Cuban invasion, Khrushchev was like, hey, you know if you just removed your missiles from Turkey, we'd remove ours from Cuba? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. It was a bit more complicated than- Okay. How do these world leaders- get through a week without every blood vessel in their brain just exploding. The, the, like, honestly, when my, you know, when the tags on my license plates are due, that's a level of stress that gets to me way more than it definitely should. I can't imagine having the entire fate of the entire world at, like, your you know, your your fingertips and having to have those conversations with somebody and still maintaining your poker face. If Khrushchev called me up and he's like, you need to do this, I'd be like, bro, what we need to do, whatever's going to stop this. You know, if he wanted to sit back to back in a chair with me with those foam rubber bats and just whack it, okay, whatever. But at the last second, the two sides finally came to an agreement. Soviet missiles were shipped out of Cuba and the world breathed one gigantic sigh of relief, except for one guy who was bloody livid. Phew. Let's hope that's the biggest crisis of my presidency. Unfortunately for him, his presidency was to end with one. Is that... Hang on. And this is where people are not gonna like me because I'm like, this is either Bernie Sanders or Lee Harvey Oswald. Unfortunately for him, his presidency was to end with one. Having nearly blown up the planet, a few changes were made. First, the superpowers agreed to a limited test ban treaty. Secondly, the Soviets ousted Khrushchev and replaced him with Leonid Brezhnev, who was a kisser. He liked to kiss. Both oh, wait, what? For real? Who <laughs> the puckered lips. Who was a kisser. He liked to kiss. Both sides were deeply concerned. Again, I'm not, I'm not calling anyone out for any, anything that they're into, just... The person with their finger on the nuclear... You wouldn't expect them to have, right, their hand on the nuclear button and their lips on yours. That's... The prospect of nuclear odd. war. But still, the arms race raged on throughout the 60s and 70s. U.S. intelligence worked out that the Soviets' nuclear arsenal was not as powerful as they previously thought. But in fact, it was America that held the advantage. ABMs and MIRVs were developed, and the doctrine of MAD. If both sides knew they would be completely destroyed by a nuclear war, neither would risk starting one. But even without war, the world was already feeling the effects of nuclear weapons. In 1966, above the pleasant town of Palomares in Spain, a U.S. bomber collided with a tanker mid-air, and four hydrogen bombs fell and landed near the town below. It hasn't exploded, so I'm sure everything's fine. Whoa, boy. Uh, hey, I wouldn't eat that if I were you. Okay. What were you gonna do today? Go for a swim? Yeah, I wouldn't. Are you breathing right now? Yeah? Yeah. 
I wouldn't. It took the Americans two and a half months to find one of the bombs, which had gone- To find one! No! And then, I'm pretty sure this happened- Again, not to say that anything is better or worse, but I remember reading stories about, like, this happening in the U.S. too. Like, there was a plane- There was a plane that was supposed to be, like, a dummy plane or whatever, and it actually had, like, live ammo in it, and at one point- we dropped a nuke on one of our own cities in the U.S., but it didn't explode or something. Like, there was some weird thing with the payload on it where, yeah, n nuclear weapons have almost done more self-harm than... Missing in the ocean. Good. This was the 14th time America had lost a nuclear bomb since 1950. Yes! That's what I'm saying! Th don't call them broken arrow incidents. That makes it sound pleasant. The we accidentally dorped a bomb on you incident. Since time America had lost a nuclear bomb since 1950. Nobody knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost. So sleep well tonight. After <laughs> Kennedy's assassination, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson took over, and he inherited a developing crisis in the East, Vietnam. Back in the 50s, the Vietnamese had kicked their French colonizers out once and for all, and the country was divided into two. In the North, a communist regime, and in the South, an anti-communist regime. Both were led by very sweet-looking old men, but don't let that deceive you. They were both ruthless dictators, and both- Yeah, no, I've learned that uh, when you say that somebody's a sweet old man, it's not gonna mean that they're sweet old man. Dreamed of reuniting Vietnam under their own regime. So the North established the National Liberation Front, also known as the Viet Cong, to carry out a campaign of guerrilla warfare in the South with Soviet support. Support. The U.S. sent advisors to help train the South Vietnamese to deal with the threat, but President Diem's brutal policies pushed more and more South Vietnamese to support the Viet Cong. And over the next decade, the situation escalated to a breaking point. America feared the domino effect. That is, if South Vietnam fell to communism, would Cambodia be next? Then Laos? Thailand? Burma? India? LVJ had to make a choice between losing South Vietnam or sending in the troops. And so in they went. From 19... An interesting thing about the that declaration, um, it happened at Syracuse, where I did my grad school for like journalism. And every day when I was walking to like the newsroom, I would walk through the courtyard where he gave that speech. And like literally every day, I would think about that because they had a big plaque uh, pointing that out in the area, which is a really odd way to start your day. Sixty-five. America found itself in a war unlike anything it had ever fought before. Let's play Spot the Viet Cong Soldier. To be fair, it was kind of like the Revolutionary War, except instead of us being the ones doing the guerrilla warfare, uh, they were the ones doing the guerrilla warfare. I'm going to say there's probably like 10 here. Let's see what we can find. Looks like there might be one there. Looks like... Looks like maybe one there. Maybe one there. Maybe one there. Those look like hands. And there's probably a bunch up in the trees I'm not seeing. Did you see him? Of course not. That's because millions of young American men were drafted and sent to fight a ruthless enemy who used the thick jungle as its shield. It was nearly impossible. I thought you were going to at least reveal. Possible to tell where the enemy was, or worse, who it was. And as a result, the civilian population got caught up in the brutal crossfire. The city of Saigon- There's a dude named Dave Rabbit, by the way. Um, look him up on YouTube. He, he was, he was a Vietnamese soldier and he, well, he was an American soldier in Vietnam and his specialty was radio. So what he did, he went to a massage parlor and he set up a makeshift radio station out there and he would broadcast to other troops and he would play like rock music. He would tell them where like the police raids were going to be all this weird stuff. And there's only, I think one broadcast that survived. Somebody taped it when they were listening on like the armed forces radio network or, you know, one of the armed forces channels around the world. But yeah, if you look up Dave rabbit, Radio First Termer, you will not be disappointed. Dawn found itself under regular attack, and America launched a bombing campaign in the north during Operation Rolling Thunder. The Viet Cong used the Ho Chi Minh Trail running through Laos and Cambodia to supply the campaign. It was a long and brutal war, and I could never do it justice in this video. But in terms of the Cold War, Vietnam was probably the biggest of many, many global conflicts that signaled a turning point.
Under the threat of nuclear war, the two superpowers began working to make their relationship more constructive, and as a result, their ideological battle shifted away from the potential of direct conflict and more towards attempting to inf- I like that they're both using Japanese weapons. You notice that? America and Russia both have Japanese weapons. We have the Buster Sword and they have a Katana. ...influenced smaller proxy wars around the world. In the Middle East, the Soviet Union provided aid against Israel during the Six-Day War. And then again, when the US backed Israel during the Yom Kippur War. In Africa, the Angolan Civil War saw US-supported South Africans fighting Soviet-supported Cubans. In the conflict between Somalia and Ethiopia, the superpowers interestingly switched sides as regimes changed. And the US continued fighting the spread of communism in its own backyard, funding the famous Contra groups to fight the socialist junta in Nicaragua. These proxy wars were fierce enough to begin with, but superpower intervention amplified the destruction and created 66 to 90. 15 years here, 21 years here. Imagine you join the military and imagine you're thinking about like, oh, I'm going to protect America. And then you get sent the to levels of human 24 year war you get sent to any of these and people are like oh you know it's a it's a peacetime us and russia we're really getting along and you get home and you're like dude not the way i saw it suffering throughout the third world My and God. in vietnam that human suffering was all being broadcast back home by a good old television going into the late 60s america was a changing nation this became this this became this and this became this the new slogan well, that was good. taking root, make love, not war. The majority of Americans did not- Is that? Is this Forrest Gump? Make love, not Jenny. war. The majority of Americans did not approve of Johnson's handling of the Vietnam War. And in 1968, a silent majority elected law and order candidate Richard Nixon. As the Vietnam War appeared to be increasingly unwinnable and public opinion turning increasingly sour, Nixon made the decision to begin bringing the troops home and ended US involvement in Vietnam by 1973. Two years later, the South fell. The Cold War was now taking its toll on both superpowers. In Russia, a huge percentage of the budget was still going to the military. People were still hungry, and they just didn't have access to the same lifestyle. <sighs> the old boiled shoes. Are you still trying to peel potatoes with a shoe? We have vegetable peelers. Defe That's right, the Berlin Wall hasn't fallen yet. I completely forgot about that. As the West. And what did they have to show for it? They weren't even winning the space race anymore. Both sides needed to reduce spending in order to rescue their economies. And so both welcomed with open arms an easing of hostilities, otherwise known as detente. To improve relations, Nixon became the first US president to visit Moscow in 1972. And Brezhnev returned the gesture a year later. A number of treaties were signed, including the 1972 SALT agreement that limited nuclear weapons. Relations okay. with China were even improving via ping pong diplomacy when the US table tennis team went on a tour of the People's Republic. However, internally, China was still pushing anti-capitalist propaganda, which led to some mixed messages. Nixon even visited China in 1970. I feel like that's how everywhere in the world is, man. That's... You just, any time you travel abroad as an American, you just assume everyone thinks you're an idiot. And, and it's just sort of something that we've had to, we've had to come to, uh, come to accept. That's why you tell people when you travel abroad, you're Canadian. Too. And it was a barrel a of thing. laughs. Today, the president walks among priceless treasures from China's golden age. Among them, a pair of ear stoppers used by the emperor to keep from hearing criticism. Why do I feel like that's not true? Give me a pair. Everything was going great for Nixon until it was uncovered that back home he was being a very naughty boy and violating constitutional protocol. I'm announcing today my resignation as president and I'm passing the office to my vice president, Gerald Ford. Wow, you mean in America the people can actually remove their leader when he breaks the law? Why not just rule by force? Where's the corruption? And my first act as president is to pardon Nixon. Ah. There we go. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that I say things in time with the Russian leaders. There it is. After the whole fiasco, Americans decided what they really wanted was just a nice safe guy who wouldn't cheat on them. So they elected Jimmy Carter and the two sides met in Vienna where they signed yet another strategic arms limitation treaty. It's an honor, Premier Brezhnev. Likewise, President Carter. Please don't do that. But that's not to say there was no longer any tension between the two sides. And then after Jimmy Carter finished in office, he would just go back to like Habitat for Humanity, like building homes for people who need them. As an actual thing, like, and it, I don't know, maybe that's why he's, is he still the oldest surviving president? 
I th he's still alive, right? It's because there was heaps of it. Once again, the Soviet Union put down further attempts at reform and rebellion in the Eastern Bloc. The Euro missile crisis saw new and improved classes of intermediate range missiles being deployed in Europe. In 1979, the Soviets thought it would be a good idea if they had their own Vietnam and invaded Afghanistan to prevent a US sponsored Islamic insurgency. And in response to these various crises, Olympic Games were boycotted. Conservatives were concerned that US policy had become too soft. You let him kiss you. That is exactly how this would play out in 2022, by the way. And it's interesting, too, because, again, now that we're getting closer to, you know, uh, modern day, it starts to hit on those things where, like, I or, you know, like, or my parents especially remember. And it's just that whole thing of, like, you hear about that missile crisis in Europe. But then as Americans, often the response was like, yeah, but that's over there. We are over here. And it's not until like it got to Cuba that everyone started and to in worry. in 1980, they decided they wanted a president who would be tough on communism. So they elected Ronald Reagan. And Reagan came in guns blazing. Concerned at the Soviet Union's human rights violations, he made a speech calling them an evil empire. And he also wanted to renew the arms race using technological advances in computing and lasers. He came up with the Space Defense Initiative, also known as Star Wars, which was basically yeah. a big defensive anti-nuke shield around the country. But a lot of people thought it was a pretty dumb idea. The Soviet Union perceived this shift in rhetoric as the USA getting ready for war. And they were feeling especially threatened as their relationship with their communist ally China had broken down. Relations took a big hit in 1983, when the Soviets shot down a Korean airliner that had strayed into their airspace, and it looked like the world was going right back to mid 20th century Cold War tension. But it feels so bad for the rest of the world. <laughs> the the right getting real sick of this. Century cold and the worst part, well, maybe not the worst part, but one of the bad parts about this is most of this weaponry, even at this point, is now 20 years old, and these this pile of bombs this pile of bombs it's the same stuff we've got now 50 60 year old missiles and we just sort of hope that they're gonna work in the event that they're actually needed attention but then brezhnev got really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and he was replaced by mikhail gorbachev coming into office in 1985 he was it's almost like electing people who are in their 70s and 80s is not the best idea as we as we look at electing people in their 70s and 80s in the next several the real years. Game changer. His philosophy differed a lot from previous Soviet leaders. He felt that the reason the Soviet system and economy was struggling was that it didn't allow the Soviet people to find satisfaction in their work because they weren't allowed to speak freely and lived in fear. Gorbachev wanted the Soviet people to be happy, but unlike previous Soviet leaders, he actually made the change happen. Within the first couple of years, he began the political movement for more openness and transparency and the restructuring of the Soviet political and economic systems and change very quickly took effect. People could criticize the government. They could enjoy Western pop culture. The media don't criticize the government. They could enjoy. All right, we got don't hassle the Hoff. David Hasselhoff, boom boxes. I love the West fidget spinner, oh, denim. Okay, calm down. Calm down, Captain America. Western pop culture. The media interviewed Margaret Thatcher, but most importantly, the Soviet people could now enjoy Pizza Hut. All hail to Gorbachev. He also knew that the arms race needed to end in order to rescue the Soviet. Nobody. Nobody, no matter what your political affiliation, apparently out pizzas the hut. Yo, Pizza Hut. Email in my profile. Let's let's get something done here. Economy and a positive relationship with the West must be established. Constructive dialogue reopened and resulted in the INF Treaty, which saw all intermediate range missiles eliminated, which was huge. Reagan's tone towards the Soviet Union began to soften and things were looking up. But what would these reforms mean for the Eastern Bloc? For decades, the Soviets had been brutally suppressing any attempt at change. Now, would they be allowed? And that was the exact question on Hungary's lips when the Prime Minister visited Moscow. Gorbachev's response, he didn't necessarily agree with the reforms, but he wouldn't stop them either. He was prepared to let the Eastern Bloc choose its own future. Th and I know this isn't going to be the case because it's never the case, but... Of all the people we've seen dealing with things, he seems the most chill. This was massive, and the Hungarian leaders began planning free, multi-party elections. Poland followed suit, and also held elections in June. The anti-Soviet party, Solidarity, won 99 out of 100 seats in the Senate. But not just that. In Hungary, the barbed wire border between East and West was removed. The Iron Curtain was unraveling. But not all Eastern Bloc leaders were happy. Notably, East Germany was still ruled by a hardline Stalinist, Erich Honecker, and many East Germans were still eager to get out. They had been trapped by the Berlin Wall, but now- When's the next video? Punish me severely.
Uh, it looks like the UN Bravado and La Via. Be yourself. Upload more videos. No more economic downturn. Dude, why? I just like this wall. This wall's pretty badass. Oh, they were doing the math. If they could. Not the Berlin Wall. The the representation of it in the video. I just realized. They traveled to Hungary, and Hungary's border with the West was loosening. Could they now make it to the West? That summer, East Germans decided Hungary was the latest top holiday destination. They traveled there in droves, and using various methods, tens of thousands crossed the border into Austria and the West. Honecker was furious and blocked travel to Hungary, but that civil liberties train had started rolling, and it wasn't stopping. Thousands more flocked to the West German embassy in in Prague, where they stormed the fence around the embassy gardens and a temporary refugee camp was set up. In September, deals were struck to allow the refugees to travel west via train. Back in East Germany, the people were running on a civil liberties high and they wanted their next hit. Dissent was growing. Man, and again, like, we, we think, you know, some of the things that we've dealt with in the past few years have been awful, when in reality they were minor inconveniences especially when you take into account everything that you hear about these people dealing with and that's not even to scratch the surface of a lot of what goes on you know in africa asia even here in the u.s you know north america south america like all these different places we you know we think of our minor inconveniences as the worst thing ever and then you see something like this even in a funny context and you're like oh yeah, not so much. Over time, demonstrations turned to mass protest, with plainclothes secret police officers doing their best to put down the dissent. Back to beating people well with sticks again. Control. And worse, the biggest demonstration was yet to come. We're gonna put all of this down by force. Right, guys? Guys? Unfortunately, everyone had realized what he had not. This was bigger than them and the entire East German Politburo voted him out of power. On November 4th, over half a million East Germans took to the streets of East Berlin. For many, there was still one big target left in their sights, that damn wall. The pressure yep. on the East German government was too great. And on November 9th, they made a bit of a chaotic announcement that the travel ban between East and West was being lifted. The change wasn't meant to take a- Do they have McDonald's logos? I'm not wrong, this looks like a McDonald's logo, right? You see it? I'm not crazy. East and West was being lifted. The change wasn't meant to take effect until the next day, and crossing guards still had orders to shoot on sight any who tried to cross. But that night, huge crowds gathered at the crossing points, and the guards were overwhelmed. In an astronomically historic moment, after decades of family separation and travel restriction, the people were allowed to pass through. East and West Berliners couldn't believe it, and celebrated together throughout the night. Some even climbed the wall and began to topple it. The Iron Curtain had fallen, and a year later, Germany would be reunited. Elections in Bulgaria, a peaceful revolution in Czechoslovakia. It always sounds like those moments sound so cool, and I can't tell if the reason, like in my brain, I look at these pictures, you know, and they're so moving and they're so powerful. I can't tell if it's because Something about it is like being raised American. I somehow feel like that was like a win. Like my team won the Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Like, do you feel that same way? Like, or is it, is it because this is an objective good? And I've, it would seem, that's where it gets so weird, right? Because I am about I was about to say, it would seem like it's an objective good, but I don't know that I'm objective about it. So... I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. But I see that picture and I'm like, dang, that is that is something. And a year later, Germany would be reunited. Elections in Bulgaria, a peaceful revolution in Czechoslovakia, and a violent one in Romania brought to an end communist authority in the Eastern Bloc. America decided it would be best if it just stayed away and let the change happen, as the anti-communist movement continued all the way back to Moscow. Gorbachev had given the people the freedom to demonstrate. Now, they demonstrated for an end to the communist single-party rule, and Gorbachev had to give in. For the first time in history, elections were held in which candidates not officially endorsed by the party were allowed to run. Ambitious rival of Gorbachev, Boris Yeltsin, led a growing democratic movement now things here get quite confusing and well and and especially i don't think we're going to cover the entire rest of russia in the next two minutes but 
that definitely doesn't seem to seem to be the case today. The dissolution of the Soviet Union is a complicated topic, so believe me, this is oversimplified. But it went a little bit like this: the Soviet ah roll credits. He said the thing. The Soviet Union was made up of a number of smaller Soviet republics, the largest of which was Russia. Yeltsin got himself elected the president of Russia and began a struggle for sovereignty against Gorbachev and the Greater Soviet Union. Communist hardliners were horrified at what Gorbachev was allowing, so they briefly kidnapped him and tried to set up their own emergency government. But Yeltsin and his supporters all gathered around the White House in Moscow and were like, no, we have a tank. So the hardliners had to concede and released Gorbachev. Wow, thanks Boris. That was a close one. No problem. And thanks to you for all the great freedom you've given us. Any time, Now pal. get out. And just to inform you, I've used that freedom you've given us to go behind your back and make a deal with Ukraine and Belarus to dissolve the Soviet Union and set up the Russian Federation. In other words, you're no longer in charge. I am. Dude. <laughs> so uncool. And so decades of tension and the everlasting threat of nuclear war finally came to an end as democratic governments were established in many of the old Soviet republics, and the world got along together forever after. Right, guys? Yeah. I was about to say, but... But... Hey, this modern art thing is growing on me. Where can I learn to do that? Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning Nice. So now we know that if you want modern art, you can learn modern art through uh, through Skillshare. That's pretty cool. Even even Khrushchev apparently, who I didn't think was around anymore, can learn uh, can can learn some modern art that way. Although there is something to say about that, like you know the the fact that a dead person could create modern art. So that's the end of the Cold War. Where do we go from here? Leave a comment and let me know. As for final thoughts on all of this, I mean. It's it's difficult because you want to watch it from the perspective of, you know, thank God we don't have to deal with that anymore, but uh, given what I'm filming this video in this particular time in history, it seems like we're kind of right back there, or, or at least there in more of a sense of the word than we would like to be. So hopefully, you know, future comments on this video are like, ah, you're making a big deal over nothing. You know, I would gladly appreciate that. But as for right now, Cooler heads need to prevail before we can get to that point where we're like raw, like uh, like oversimplified said, where we're raw raw. Everyone's living in peace and harmony forever. So, on that uh, semi-depressing note, thanks for checking out the video. If you liked it, please please subscribe. Uh, only a small percentage of people are, and it helps a lot if you do subscribe. Take care, of my friends, and I will see you for the next one.